Welcome to Dance Talks. My guest today is Kathleen King, founder of and creator of what is possibly the most uh, well-loved and largest selling cookies in the, con in the country and maybe around the world right now as Tate's Cookies. I'm sure you've heard of it. She's um, come out with a new book. Um, it's a children's book and uh, she's from Southampton. Are you there? Do you live there in Southampton now? I do. I live here year round. And um, tell us a little bit about the book. The book, I was approached um, by Loie, who is a children's book author, um, to do uh, a little story about my um, my time creating, you know, taped cookies and uh, my humble beginnings at the farm. And uh, so I was like, sure, that sounds fun. So, you know, we talked, I gave her the story. Um, I sent a bunch of pictures. We worked with an illustrator to get like the photos, you know, to be accurate, but also fun and chill. And uh, she actually wrote the words from my story and uh, it came out really cute. Yeah, it's uh, for like four to eight year olds. What what's the name of the book and when is it being published or is uh, it Cookie Queen? It is Cookie Queen and it is been published already by Random House. And I have a book signing at Tate's Bake Shop on August 6th at 11 o'clock. And um, are you having more of them or or is that your kickoff? Oh, it's coming more, up. More books, you mean? Uh, no, it's coming up. Oh, yeah, it's coming yeah. up. Yeah, it's this Sunday. What time? 11 o'clock. Um, are you planning another book or is this it? Are you, is you know, I'm, I'm never planning a book, but somehow I have like four or, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, this was kind of just an opportunity that, that, that came my way that sounded cute. And I have at this point, 11, uh, great nieces and nephews, um, in that age group. So I just thought it, I, I really kind of was compelled to, to go ahead with it because I wanted to, the book is dedicated to them and I wanted to have them to have the book and be part of my legacy project. And, and, you know, also the book kind of talks about, uh, you know, me go, trying to make the best thing that I could and not, not giving up. And I think that in the big picture, that's just a great lesson for everybody. Tell me, um, well, before we see anything else, just on the side of your head is a bag of tapes oh, yeah. on the wall, which I believe are chocolate chip just from this. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, that oh, is. Tell us, tell us about how you first came to bake uh, that recipe, which I presume has never changed. Uh, no, you know, um, you, the, um, you know, I like um thin cookies or chewy cookies I've never been a, a fat cakey cookie girl so you know when I started at the farm I went off the back of the the Nestle bag and of course I was 11 so I measured somewhat recklessly and um you know and it would kind of organically evolved into what I I settled on what I thought was uh, a great cookie uh I was also at that age, of, you know, I had a tremendous amount of pride in my work. If my, my mother, of course, would do all my food shopping because, of course, I can drive. And yeah. if she brought me home something like, oh, I found chocolate chips on sale. I got this or this. And I would have a fit. I'd be like, no, I don't like those. I'm not using that. You know, I was very particular when I think back yes. at it now, like, oh, my mom, my mother, my mother, my mother hit me. Yes. <laughs> And uh, you you had a table out in front of the farm. This is on uh, Noyak Road, or on Noyak Road, uh, North Sea Farms, and it's still on Noyak Road. My brother runs the farm now. My, both my parents passed. And um, how how long did you have a stand? Was it just summers that you would do this? It was summers, and then uh, on the holiday weekends, um, I would bake again on the holiday weekends because more people were out and the climate, you know, was different back then summer was packed and then it was very very quiet and then 
you know, on a holiday, like a Columbus Day weekend or something like that, um, things would pick up again. And so I'd always make cookies to sell. Um, everyone loved your cookies from the get go. I remember yeah. that. And um, when did uh, people urge you to move on to something more permanent? Well, it was really my mom um, when I was 20 and I finished two years of college and I went home and I was baking cookies that summer. And she said, what are your plans? And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) And she said, well, there's a bakery for rent in town and you can't use the kitchen anymore after the summer. I was like, "Okay, all right, I'll go look, you know, and. You know, she always pushed us to be independent. Um, And, you know, she probably saw that I wasn't really making any plan after college and I wasn't going to more college. So she didn't want me to, you know, just stay at home. Were you an only child or did your brother? No, I was the youngest of four. Wow. Okay. So blast out. Blast out. Yeah. And, you know, we were kind of told, you know, it was kind of like a given. 18 or so, you were, you were out. Which so, was a good, which so a good you point. You rent the shop at that point? I did. So I rented the shop, the, my first bake shop, which was next to the Clam Man, um, when I was 20. And um, what happened? We, you named your, your cook. Were you doing just chocolate chip cookies at that point? Uh, no. Um, I you were also doing cakes and... I did. I did a little bit of everything. I did some a few pies. I did some few cakes. I did a couple muffins and a couple different kinds of cookies. I, you know, I didn't start off with a huge line, um, but I wasn't just doing cookies. And um, so, what happened? What I recall, and you may, I'm sure you remember this, was uh, at a certain point. Um, I guess maybe when you were 25 or 28 or around there, um, you ran into some financial trouble with your accountants. Yeah, that um, it actually was 20 years later when I was 40. Uh, I made an effort, you know, to take on partners because well, by that time, the whole town and community loved Kathleen's cookies. Yes. They were called at that time. Yes, yes. And I might mention, Prior to that time, there was another product, a sugary product in Southampton called Crutchley's Donut Hole. Yeah. Yes, yes. So it was a tradition of, of people liking a particular product, and they were all proud of you for having done this as a, a Yeah, good. you know, it was, an, it was an, really like a, um, you know, Hallmark made for TV movie, the way, you know, the <laughs> The, the town really came up to protect me. And I used to say, you know, I knew people liked the store. I had no idea they loved it. I remember they, you, you got involved with these two guys who were accountants. Right. And uh, they kind of put you in the corner because they were the so two of them, one of you. And right, you know. exactly. So they had majority of everything. And, and then they fired me, you know, and that started the lawsuit, which ultimately I lost my name. Yep. Uh, but and maintained during that time the town actually demonstrated it in front of your bake shop. They did. They picketed it in front of the shop not for people not to go in. It was amazing. <laughs> yep. was. So so these these guys thought they were going to take over the name and make a national cookie. Had you planned to do something like that before they Thought of it well, or? you know, we had planned to to grow the company, of course, but um, we had two different ideas. They told me I took too much pride in my work. I told them the day you take your customer as a fool is the day you start to lose your company, blah, blah, blah. Needless to say, they fired me. And uh, the building that I'm in, that the Tates is in today, I bought that when I was 23. And I was able to resell that. Um, and to remortgage that to get some money to start Tate's, which is named after my dad. Um, and they took my name and they moved the company to Virginia. And it, it, within a year, they destroyed everything. They, they, I, I tasted their cookies. They were terrible. Oh, or, I, 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 yeah. I, I only crazy. had them when they were still in Southampton. And that was my freak out because <laughs> everything they made was horrible. 
It was, I wouldn't call it horrible. I would say it was like uh, ordinary crappy cookies you can buy in a store. Well, maybe, that's horrible to me. <laughs> maybe worse. It, did you, did you, um, so they, they went down there as I, I, I remember and they took everything with you and they allowed you to have your bake shop. Is that yes. how, no, that was yes. the, so I, I got them out of the, the bake shop and they wanted to just really do wholesale anyway. And I took the bake shop back over because I owned the building because I bought it when I was young. Thank God. I, I That's how I got money to, to move forward. And um, so what happened after that? I mean, there, a long time after that, maybe there was a competition with um, uh, Tate's Cookies and the rest of the cookies in the country. I think it was. I think it was with Consumer Reports. Yeah, Consumer Reports, and they they voted uh, Tate's Cookies the number one cookie in in the country, which was kind of like my goal. I felt like, cool, I'm done. <laughs> but then you decided to try. Well, let's get rid of these guys at first before we talk about what happened next. Yeah, they went bust. Yes, and they deserved it. Yeah, they did. And I don't wish harm on anybody, but they really did. Yep. Anyhow, um, Tate's then continued on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you decided to start expansion. And how did that come about? Yeah, well, the, the minute I opened Tate's, I, I had a plan that I had to build a brand, a new brand, and uh, grow it. And then I needed an exit plan because I worked for myself and I wasn't getting any younger. So I decided, you know, I was 40 at the time and I decided I would retire at, at 55, um, which some say seems young. But for me, when I was working, you know, in my 20s and, you know, 18 hours a day, six days a week, that wasn't young to me. I was ready to, to be free. Um, so that was the plan. And um, I executed that. How did, what, what did it consist of? What was the plan? How did you carry it out? Well, first of all, I had to get back on my feet and start breathing. That was number one. And then number, number two was I had to try to get my wholesale, comp, my wholesale accounts back that I had with Kathleen. Oh, right. So it was a competition between Kathleen's and Tate's for a little while. Um, and uh, and then, um, and then we just strategically did the, you know, East Coast, then the West Coast, then Texas, then the middle. And, you know, you start off with your top tier stores because you're a high end cookie brand. And then when you saturate that, you move into the second tier, um, you know, like Costco and Fresh Market and Whole Foods and those things. As, as I remember it, um... Uh, you partnered and sold or sold or became one of the owners of w w first um, three different, each one larger company than the one before. Is that right? Well, no, I, I sold to Riverside, which is a private equity company. Um, and Riverside sold to Mondelez. Mondelez is, for all of you who don't know, it's probably the largest food manufacturer in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they and, do. Uh, they do a lot of brands that people recognize: Toblerone, Wheat Thins, Chips Ahoy, Oreo, and uh, and many other products. So they, and many, many, many others. I just named a few that are like every you house. You can go into a, a cookie store or a big shop or a supermarket in Beirut. Or in Cairo, or is it around the world? Well, Mondelez is. Tate's is not. I don't. I don't know where Tate's is outside of the country. I'm sure that it is, uh, but I don't know where. And how did because they once go Riverside sold to Mondelez, I was a hundred percent out. How did they? How did it happen? But your name is still in the bag, right? Yeah, I know. Now, how did that happen? I mean, they, they must have wanted you and your recipe and make sure it well, came out. Well, Riverside rebranded Tate's. You know, they rebranded the look of Tate's, the color of Tate's, um, with my name on the bag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, 
So they sold that to Mondelez and Mondelez has maintained uh, that particular look. Usually having a, a, a money outfit is not a good idea, although often, in, and in this case, it's a tremendous idea. They take a risk, but often- it everybody, everybody takes a risk. You know, I, I stayed on with Riverside uh, upon their request, because they also want to make sure you know, the owners got skin in the game because, and they're not being sold a bill of goods. Yep. So I was very happy that they were able um, to sell the company and make more than what they thought they would in the beginning, which was great because that was my brand and that's what I said it could do. And, and they did it. And that was cool. Well, the, you also opened a factory, I believe, in Mauritius. Well, the factory, when, when I sold to Riverside, we had a factory in East Mauritius, and I had 200 employees at the time when I sold. And, uh, well, that's quite a ways along the road. Of Well, at the time, it was about 30 minutes, and we didn't have this traffic situation that we have today. That would have changed everything. Is it still there, that factory? still yes, operating? it is. Yeah, Mondelez, Riverside kept it. Mondelez and everybody expands on it. And I'm really happy about that too, because some of my amazing staff from back in the day is still employed there. And uh, so that makes me very happy. How many, how many people are employed in that factory now? I really have no idea, but if I had to guess, I think maybe 450. So it's up there with one of the largest employers in the online. Yeah, that that I don't know. Um I don't know that data, but yeah. they employ a lot of people and um, it's a nice company to work for. I know my my staff is relatively happy. I mean, it's corporate and corporate has its challenges, especially when you're not corporate and especially if you're an entrepreneur. But, um, you know, they do the job. Did you ever have a problem keeping them on the straight and narrow as far as the recipe is concerned? I don't work with Mondelez at all. But you do have the recipe, or you did. Oh, they own everything. Yes, but you, you, you. It says on the. It says yeah, on. Yeah, I, I know because they kind of own me too. Yes, and you know. uh, that's been a remarkable story from an eleven-year-old. Yeah. On a yeah, it's been. You know, sometimes I don't really think about it much, but then you know, when I stop and think about it, it's. It was one hell of a journey. Yes. You know? And sometimes people say, oh, well, you got lucky. I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, but that was not luck. <laughs> that was some freaking hell of a journey. I think one of those sales was over $100 million. You may, I don't know. And it's not my business, but right. I mean, it was a huge outfit purchase. Uh -huh. Few people have ever seen. Uh, do you tell that story in your, in your book, the kid's book? No, no. The, the kid's book is uh, purely me at 11 years old at the farm, making a deal with my father, working on making and creating the best cookie possible. And in the end, creating a cookie I was happy with and selling it up the stand. And um, where, do you, where, are you, where do you go from here? Or how did you spend your, um, I guess, your post cookie? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know what? It's so funny. People tell me I'm the busiest retired person they know. Um, <laughs> you know, I just like living. I like doing new things. I I don't occupy my time with boards or any of that kind of thing. I do some philanthropic work, but I don't um, I don't volunteer or um, do boards because you know, my calendar was controlled my whole life. I wanted to be free. And I do a lot of things. You know, I, I bike. Um, I took a ceramics class. I take salsa dancing lessons. I travel. I do all the things I never did when I was a kid. I remember during the time you were having your struggles, I seem to remember you would go off on a trailer. You go to, a, at least I could be wrong. But it seemed like a very athletic kind of life. You'd you'd go off uh, fishing or something like that. It was well. I'm not a, a fisherman. <laughs> I don't like fishing. Um, but um, I do love the outdoors. And 
you know, I, I love anything that's outdoors and moving. I can't um, say that I'm like a real adventurer, but <laughs> I do love, you know, all kinds of outdoor activities, camping, hiking, paddleboard, yeah, uh, you awesome. know, all, all those things. I, I like that. Well, it's it's very nice of you to be on this podcast. I haven't seen you in a long time. And I, no, I know. Do you spend all your time out here? Um, pretty much. I'm I'm in the city part of the time and out here part of the time. Uh-huh. Okay. Every, every week, pretty much. Great. And, well, it's nice seeing you still at it. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. And, uh, thank you. Thanks again. I enjoyed this very much. Thank oh, you. you're welcome. And thanks for having me, Dan. It was nice to see you. You too. Bye-bye. Take care.